In 1992, Ruby Ridge in Idaho was the scene of an 11-day siege. It began on the 21st of August when deputies of the United States Marshal Service initiated action to apprehend and arrest Randy Weaver under a bench warrant after his failure to appear on firearms charges. This standoff resulted in the deaths of a US Deputy Marshal, Weaver's wife and son, and his dog. A year later, in Waco, Texas, David Koresh, head of the Branch Davidians, was involved in a standoff with authorities. This 51-day siege came to an end when fire destroyed the compound, leaving 86 people dead in total. The Waco siege and the 1992 standoff at Ruby Ridge have been cited as catalysts for the Oklahoma City bombing, one of the worst domestic terror attacks in US history. On that day in 1995, 168 men, women and children lost their lives. All these events together were a catalyst for the growth of the anti-government movement and armed militias. During the 1990s, a wave of anti-government sentiment was sweeping across the nation and at its height, over 800 armed militia groups were in existence. Some of these groups were part of the sovereign citizen movement, which believes the government has no right to tax or impose laws on them. Following crackdowns after the Oklahoma City bombing, many anti-government groups disappeared. But the threat from hardcore elements still continued to exist. Between the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 and the events we're going to look at in this video, which happened in 2010, approximately 30 law enforcement officers lost their lives to homegrown extremists. On May the 20th, 2010, two West Memphis police officers were shot and killed during a routine traffic stop. The incident shook the small town of West Memphis and sent shockwaves through the state of Arkansas. In this video, we'll take a closer look at what happened that day, the aftermath of the shooting, and what we can learn from this tragedy. Jerry and Joe Kane, the perpetrators in this senseless act of violence, were a father and son team who travelled the country giving seminars on how to circumvent the legal system. According to Jerry Kane's girlfriend, his resentment of the government began in the late 1990s when one of his daughters died aged six weeks old of infant death syndrome and an autopsy was performed against his wishes. Kane, who was a lifelong Ohio resident, grew distrustful of authorities, gave up his driver's license and job as a trucker and became increasingly antagonistic towards Ohio law enforcement. In 2006, Kane was indicted for forgery and theft of a car by deception in Montgomery County, Ohio. And at the time of this incident and his subsequent death, there was a warrant out for his arrest. Kane said that driver's licenses were a debt contract and a month before the shooting, he was arrested in New Mexico for driving without a license. On an internet radio show, Kane said he was picked up at a Nazi checkpoint, spent 47 hours in custody and planned to sue for $100 per hour of custody. In fact, he was released on a $1,500 bond and did not appear for his court date three days before the shooting. Around 2006, Kane started posting about redemption theories on a sovereign citizen forum. In 2007, his wife passed away from pneumonia. And around 2008, at the height of the mortgage crisis, Ken shifted from being an internet poster to starting his own debt elimination seminars business. Joseph Ken, his son, travelled the country with his father, whom he assisted on his seminars. He was homeschooled and by the age of nine, he could recite the Bill of Rights and carry the toy gun everywhere he went. And according to law enforcement, the child had been taught not to trust law enforcement. Jerry Ken had, at the time, recently begun a relationship with a Florida woman who he had met at one of his seminars. 
She herself also adhered to the sovereign citizen ideology and shortly before the shooting she had been involved in a protracted legal battle with her county of residence because she refused to pay a $20 dog license and fee. Jerry Kane was unsuccessful as a motivational speaker and his seminars were sparsely attended. He had not gained much notoriety in the sovereign citizen community and he had decided to cut off his tour early and when the shooting took place he was en route to Florida where his last seminar was scheduled to take place. After that he planned to settle in Florida and start a new life there with his girlfriend. So what we're after here is not fighting, it's conquering. Right. I don't want to have to kill anybody. But if they keep messing with me, that's what it's going to have to come out. That's what it's going to come down to is I'm going to have to kill. And if I have to kill one then I'm not going to be able to stop. I just know it. May the 20th, 2010 started out like any other day. Two veterans of our West Memphis, Arkansas Police Department, Bill Evans and Brandon Powdert, were patrolling the interstate as part of the department's drug and addiction team, something they loved to do. They became involved in what seemed to be a routine traffic stop, though I've always warned my officers there is no such thing. But really, how much more routine can you get than pulling over a father and son in what looked like a church bus? My men didn't realize who or what they were dealing with. Neither officer made it home and one of them was my son. I'm Bob Powder, Chief of the West Memphis Police Department. My officers, Bill and my son Brandon, didn't realize that there are people at war with this country that are not international terrorists. They are seemingly ordinary people, just like you and me, but they don't recognize the federal government's authority to impose laws or taxes on them. They're known as sovereign citizens, their beliefs may sound so out there that they appear comical or crazy, but don't discount or ignore these people because they are willing to kill and be killed for these beliefs. We as law enforcement officers need to recognize this very real threat so we can protect ourselves. And maybe if Brandon and Bill had been able to recognize the warning signs of sovereign beliefs, they'd be alive today. On the 20th of May 2010, at around 11.46am, West Memphis Police Officer Bill Evans initiated a traffic stop on a white Plymouth Voyager minivan that was travelling on Interstate 40 eastbound toward Airport Road. Officer Evans was running a drug interdiction operation and the vehicle driven by Jerry Kane had unusual Ohio license plates which drew his attention. Sergeant Brandon Powdert provided backup for Evans. As a sovereign citizen, Jerry Kane did not have a driver's license and his van was not properly registered. He was also carrying a brick of marijuana and there were two arrest warrants for him, one in Ohio and one in New Mexico. Upon Sergeant Powdert's arrival at the scene, Evans attempted to frisk Jerry Kane. Suddenly, Kane turned around and attacked Evans and a scuffle ensued down an embankment into a ditch. His son, Joe Kane, emerged from the passenger door of the van and opened fire with an AK-47. Powdert ran to the rear of Evans' police cruiser and returned fire with three shots from his 40 caliber Glock 22 handgun through the windows and taillight of Evans' cruiser in an attempt to hit Kane firing from the other side. He then took cover behind the hood of his cruiser which was parked directly behind Evans' cruiser. Powdert fired four more times at Kane but missed. Kane then fired multiple shots from his AK-47 through the hood of the car, striking Powdert in the head with a ricochet. Both officers were fatally wounded, Powder, 39, died at the scene and Evans, who was 38, died at the hospital. The suspects then returned to their van and sped away. Vincent Brown, a FedEx driver from Houston, Texas, witnessed the shooting and called 911. Neither officer could make an officer down call due to their fatal injuries. After the shooting, a massive manhunt was launched for the Cairns who had fled the scene in their van. Approximately two hours after the incident, Crittenden County Sheriff Dick Busby and Chief Enforcement Officer W.A. Wren stopped a white minivan believed to be the suspects at a Walmart supercentre. 
Officers Busby and Wren were wounded in a gunfire exchange with the suspects and were later hospitalised in critical condition. Wildlife Officer Michael K. Neal, responding to the brief standoff, rammed the suspect's vehicle, preventing their escape and saving the lives of Busby and Wren. Officer Neal exchanged fire with the Cairns to his windshield using his patrol rifle, killing Jerry Kane and wounding Joe Kane before exiting his vehicle and continuing the gun battle. Dozens of officers then surrounded the van and after several more minutes of gunfire, Joe Kane was shot to death by police. For his heroics, Officer Neal was awarded Law Enforcement Officer of the Year by the NRA. Michael K. Neal's truck is on permanent display at the National Law Enforcement Museum in Washington, D.C. The West Memphis police shooting was a tragic event that highlighted the risk that law enforcement officers face in their daily duties. It also shed light on the dangers posed by extremist ideologies such as the Sovereign Citizen Movement, which reject the authority of government and law enforcement. Following the shooting, law enforcement agencies across the country began to take a closer look at the Sovereign Citizen Movement and the threat it poses to officers and the general public at large. Some law enforcement agencies have implemented training programs to help officers better understand and deal with extremist groups. In addition to increased training, there have been calls for stronger laws to combat extremist groups and their ideologies. Some experts have suggested that law enforcement agencies need to work more closely with community groups and civil rights organisations to help identify and prevent the spread of extremist ideologies. Ultimately, the West Memphis police shooting serves as a sobering reminder of the importance of a strong and effective law enforcement and the need for communities to come together to support and protect our police officers. This tragedy left four people dead and a community in mourning. It highlighted the dangers that law enforcement officers face on a daily basis and it's also a reminder of the dangers dangers of extremist ideologies and the threat that they pose to our society. So we must remain vigilant in our efforts to combat extremism and support the brave men and women who serve and protect our communities. Our hearts go out to the families of officers Brandon Powdert and Bill Evans who made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community. We must never forget their sacrifice and the sacrifices made by law enforcement officers across the country who put their lives on the line every day to keep us safe.